We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Our lesson, uh, our open forum. Distinguished guests, dear colleagues, good afternoon. I'm Li Yuxiao, Secretary General of the Cybersecurity Association of China. Welcome to the IGF Open Forum, co-organized by the Bureau of International Cooperation of Cyberspace Administration of China and the Chinese Academy of Cyberspace Studies. Dear speakers, May we request you to turn on your camera and say hello to everyone. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. The theme of today's open forum is development and the rule making on artificial intelligence. AI, a major strategic technology concerning the progress of human society has profoundly impacted the international cyberspace governance system. In the past COVID-19 year, AI boasts diversified application scenarios playing a significant role in bridging the digital divide, addressing the college challenges of population aging and promoting inclusive development. Meanwhile, issues such as uh, algorithmic barriers, cybersecurity, privacy protection, data abuse has transcended traditional national boundaries. Faced with gaps in the rules and the laws, countries around the world are highly concerned with the development, security, governance, and the rulemaking on AI. The open forum bring together delegates from government agencies, international organizations, enterprises, associations, and think tanks across the global to share their ideas and their insights on the development. International governments and the rules on AI. The forum will revolve around two topics. The first is the counting age development of AI and their impacts. And the second is international governance and international cooperation on AI. Now, I hereby declare the forum officially open. I would like to give the floor to Xu Feng, Deputy Director General of Bureau of International Cooperation of the Cyberspace Administration of China. Mr. Xu, please. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good evening, good night. On behalf of the International Cooperation Bureau of Cyberspace Administration of China, welcome you all to our open forum. Now I will deliver my speech in Chinese. IGF. IGF, under the framework of the United Nations, is an important internet governance system and platform. China has attached great importance and has act actively participated in the events and activities under this framework. And we have contributed China's wisdom and solution to this issue. Artificial intelligence is an important representation of this new stage, and also it is a decisive and the critical technology innovation. It is imposing profound impacts and influences on the international community. And also governance of the artificial intelligence has been attached great importance to in the whole international society. Today, it is very timely relevant for us to hold this open forum to discuss these cutting edge issues. Hereby, in terms of de developing the artificial intelligence, I would like to share with you some of my opinions. First, we need to accelerate the recovery of economy on the basis of technology innovation. 
we have witnessed many breakthroughs based on the artificial intelligence and the AI technology has been applied to many more and uh, diversified areas. The AI technology has enabled more new models and it has been contributed to the industrial cluster effects, etc. We look forward to working together with the whole international community to seize this opportunity posed by the new round of industrial revolution and the enabling environment of innovation. And we hope that through this, we can help the faster recovery of global economy. And the second, we need to work together to rise up to the challenges and the risks. As well as the development of the AI, we also see some risks like the abuse of technology, missing of ethics, and also the infringement on the personal privacy. Faced with new issues and new challenges, the international community need to pursue win-win cooperation to to follow the new standard of the AI in terms of uh, legal system, the government governance, and the privacy protection, etc. So as to ensure that the artificial intelligence is controllable. Third, we need to deepen the multilateral and multinational cooperation. The AI development is based on the sharing of ideas of the scientific scientists in different countries. In recent years, the international community has used dialogue mechanisms like the APAC, G20, etc. We have ex exchanged many good outcomes of these dialogues, and these has been contributing to the, the development and the governance of AI technology. We are exploring to build a platform among the government, the academia, uh, the enterprises, the institutes, etc. A force we need to be people oriented and improve people's well-being. The artificial intelligence is highly relevant to the development of the, the human being. Into the backdrop of the COVID-19, artificial intelligence has been contributing to the R&D of new drugs, etc. But it cannot be ignored that the digital gap between different countries and different peoples is widening. For the sake of a better future, we need to attach great importance to the inclusiveness, and we need to pay attention to the uh, vulnerable group so as to promote the inclusive use of artificial intelligence and other new technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, faced with the pandemic and the great changes, and faced with both opportunities and the challenges, the international community need to unite rather than conflict. We need to abandon the Cold War mindset. And instead, we need to pursue a mutually a mutual trust and cooperation. And we need to work together to build a community of shared future in the cyberspace. Finally, I wish this forum a great success. Thank you. Uh, I think this very important speech, you express a very important four points uh, for Chinese government and uh, to express uh, uh, how to deal with uh, rules making on AI. Uh, thank you very much. And now let's move on the keynote speeches. The two topics I mentioned earlier are determined based on the opinions from the number of experts and organizations. In the following, each keynote speaker may give a speech of up to five minutes. The first topic is the cutting edge developments of AI and its impacts. Now, I will give the floor to Professor Gong Ke, 
president of the World Foundation of Engineering Organizations and the executive president of the Chinese Institute of New Generation Artificial Intelli Intelligence Development Strategies. Professor Gong, please. Sorry, it's wrong. Okay, Professor, please. I, I think you're going to uh, play the pre recorded presentation. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can say, So Professor Gong will give us a video speech. Uh, Professor Gong will need to communicate with the UN since they didn't give us the right of host. Uh, hello, are there any UN staff there? Hello, could you please skip the right of sharing the screen to Professor Gong? Hello, host. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the organizer asked me to talk about the uh, progress of AI technology. And uh, please allow me uh, just to uh, use some examples as snapshot to show the progress. <clears throat> So uh, let me share uh, uh, my screen. So from, from the technical perspective, uh, there is notable progress in DNN with large scale pre-training model. Reported last year uh, by OpenAI, a GDP3 model with 175 billion parameters, 45 terabits of data used for its training, and uh, more than 12 million US dollars of training cost has been released. Later on, a number of large scale pre training models has been released by different organizations, corporates. Here you show one released uh, by the Chinese uh, Institute, uh, <clears throat> which is called Wu Dao. And from this video, you see a, a very good combination of the, uh, the, the sign language, uh, the text, and the, the language. Uh, that is a kind of uh, multi-model processing of neutral language supported by this large uh, pre-training model, Wudao. And another notable import, uh, progress is in the brain-inspired computing. Here we see a light model uh, reported by MIT and Techn Technical University of Wien, which just uh, used 19 uh, <clears throat> neural train, uh, neurons, uh, brain-inspired neurons, which usually uh, needs millions of these kind of neurons in traditional DNA network. And this uh, light model has been successfully used in the control uh, autopilot and uh, uh, reported uh, by the Nature magazine last year. And another uh, progress in brain-inspired computing is the theory of completeness uh, of the brain inspired computing, which is uh, uh, reported by a team of uh, Tsinghua University uh, in Nature on October last year. And this theory 
uh, uh, <clears throat> shows that the software and hardware could be uh, discoupled and that uh, significant that could significantly significantly expand uh, the application scope of the brain inspired computing and this is uh, uh, commented by nature weekly as a breakthrough scheme in the development of brain inspired computing here you see is another very important program that uh, shows you the merge uh, of the DNN and the brain inspired network on the chip uh, reported by nature for the dual control chips. Again, uh, uh, <clears throat> reported by Tsinghua University. Another notable progress is privacy computing. We know the typical uh, privacy computing uh, algorithm is federated learning. And the new progress is so-called swarm learning. Uh, likely to the federated learning, the swarm learning also use distributed data. But instead of centralized computation, swarm learning use distributed computation with distributed data that could provide a better protection uh, of the uh, data privacy. So from the governance perspective, we see uh, a report uh, released uh, uh, early this year jointly by UNDESA, uh, UNESCO, and the, uh, the Office of uh, General uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary General's uh, Envoy of Technology and the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. This book shows uh, the ethical principles, technical standards, uh, national strategies, uh, and so on produce, uh, uh, proposed by international organizations, governments, civil societies, and corporates. And we see the requirements of transparency, accountability, auditability, respect to human rights, data protection, fairness, and technical uh, robustness are repeatedly uh, mentioned in these uh, proposals. And the uh, WHO has released its first report uh, <coughs> with uh, six principles ensuring the AI for public good. The first one is to protecting the human autonomy. The most recent progress of AI governance is the adoption <coughs> of the recommendation for AI ethics, <clears throat> it is the uh, first ever United Nations document provides a global normative framework uh, for the AI governance. And it is required by new UNESCO to its member states to report regularly every four years on their progress and uh, on their uh, progress and practices. So in summary, although AI has made important new progress in technology and governance, it is still not yet made breakthrough in the explainability of its algorithm. That should be that should become the key directions of future AI research in order to lay a foundation for trustworthy AI. In terms of governance, we think the United Nations should better play its, re, uh, its, iris, uh, its irreplaceable role and build an open governance platform with multi-stakeholders based on the principles of the Charter of the United Nations and oriented to the sustainable development goals. I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gong. It's very interesting you talk about the DNA and the brain inspired computing and the privacy computing. And also you uh, analyze about the uh, different way and uh, uh, different kind of uh, stakeholders. It's very interesting about the governance. Thank you very much. So uh, here now is David Robinson, Chair of Applied Logic. Vice Principal and the Head of College of Science and Engineering 
at University of Edinburgh. Robinson, please. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me. I'll just try to share my screen now, if I can. There we go. Now, uh, I hope everybody can can see that. Um, so, um, uh, in in my in my five minutes, I think this this fits in quite nicely. We didn't rehearse, but I think it fits in nice quite nicely with. Um, with um, uh, uh, Gong Ki's um, presentation. I want to talk a little bit about why uh, AI has grown so quickly um, uh, and why it has so much impact uh, now. So uh, I've been in AI for quite a while. I came into artificial intelligence in Edinburgh in um, the mid 1980s, uh, which was at that point, it was a big technology wave in artificial intelligence. Um, but um, that particular wave is nothing like the scale of the wave that we're seeing currently. So I want to say a little bit about why that's true. And I believe it's true because of fundamental differences in the way that uh, research and technology interacts um, uh, with our society currently. So um, uh, this slide kind of makes the point that AI is not only machine learning. In fact, uh, um, a lot of people equate AI currently with machine learning because it's so dominant. Uh, but in fact, it's a collection of many sub-disciplines, uh, and each of these is reaching a new level of maturity, uh, stimulated by advances in computation more generally. So sensors are no longer passive, but they're becoming uh, active agents on the edges of compute networks. Robotics architectures are robust enough to build full humanoid systems in an incremental way. Uh, natural language has taken advantage of huge link corpuses to raise performance to impressive levels. Um, and all of that means that human factors researchers are then able to cross what we used to call the uncanny valley from um, clearly synthetic to plausibly realistic artificial agents. That's fueled by the ability to make machine learning more of a commodity technology, uh, easily shared and applied in new domains, the sort of thing that Gong Ki was talking about. Um, meanwhile, symbolic knowledge representation hasn't gone away. It's um, now managed more rigorously at large scale through things like knowledge graphs and other uh, structured methods. And all of this is becoming accepted as part of mainstream systems engineering, importantly, which means that AI algorithms can be built in at the heart of new systems architectures rather than added on as an afterthought, which is what we used to do. Um, and the resulting explosion in numbers of semi-autonomous systems has created a new area of AI focused on coordination of social systems of agents. Gonki gave an example of one of those. Um, that's created a new potential for collaborative AI, but at the same time, it creates new security threats from adversarial AI systems. And against that backdrop of evolution of subdisciplines, many of the breakthroughs in application are coming not from individual subdisciplines, but from combinations of these. That's driving a confluence of theory into application areas, essentially a resurgence of the eclecticism of original um, uh, AI, uh, but in a much more effective and targeted style. And these confluences are now generating a different landscape and application. Um, uh, let me, um, uh, yeah, so, so for example, autonomous vehicles, realistic synthetic agents, synergistic di digital twins of complex real world systems, autonomous robotic systems with limited self and situational awareness. Um, these emergent areas are shaped by both the AI confluence and the target application area. So that's what's creating a self-reinforcing cycle from AI research and theory through the confluences forced by emerging applications and returning back to theory by discovering new synergies across subdomains. The pool of application demand forces increasing speed of translation from research to application, while the real or perceived success of applications creates a stronger push on research institutions to contribute. So we get a self-reinforcing cycle. And the energy in this system seems at least for the foreseeable future to be sufficient to maintain the current acceleration uh, which means, in my view, that uh, governance will require uh, renewed effort uh, to keep pace um, as the cycle ramp ramps up uh, the development of new systems. So thanks for listening, and I'll stop sharing.
Thank you very much, Professor Robinson, <clears throat> for your insightful speech. I'm very happy to meet you again, David, and uh, uh, see you again after this September uh, Wuzhen Summit, and uh, I hope you will all. Thanks. Now, let's welcome Ms. Zhang Hui, head of Kuangshi AI Governance Research, to give a speech. Ms. Zhang, please. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Thanks for inviting MegaV Meg to today's forum. It's also my privilege to join the discussion of AI development and its impact. And I think I will give my presentation below in Chinese. 那女士们先生们, 作为人工智能产业, Ladies and gentlemen, as a member of the AI industry, MegaV is just like um, any other technology.
Mr. Wang, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wang Bo, and uh, I work uh, in uh, Aflatech. Aflatech is an AI company. Uh, we focus on speech synthesis, uh, speech recognition, uh, machine translation, and uh, natural language pro process. Next, I will, will use Chinese uh, to introduce the progress of AI application in industry. In post-pandemic era, under the effect of iFlight Tech and other friends in our industry, artificial intelligence has achieved rapid development in source technological innovation, industrial chain safety, pandemic epidemic control and prevention, the resumption of production, etc. In the past 24 months, in uh, the, the iFlight hack has been shifted from a single point technology breakthrough to machine cognition, multimoding application, and a complicated scenario application. In a role separate in speaker's role separation, dialogue, uh, medical dialogue, generation, automated diagnosis, the overall machine translation, road targeted identification, and the multilingual comprehension competitions, we have won six champions. And in November this year, in the open ASR competition, uh, in the 15th, restricted competition lane and the seven non-restricted competition lane, the iFlight Hack has won the first in the whole world. The iFlight Hack now has opened 442 capacities, gathered 2.71 million developers, developed 1.3 million apps, and connected 3.65 partners in the ecosystem. We will work together with other leaders in the industry to provide the capacity service in, on the basis of low code and even zero code. And this platform must be multi-moding sensing. It can test the blood pressure, heartbeat, pulse, etc. And also it can sense the people through sound, signs, etc. And to enable the better learning of the Chinese language, we have built a learning platform covering the whole covering 179 countries and regions and we have got 5 million registered users we say that the artificial intelligence must be based must be used in the tangible things the sceneries and these sceneries can be promoted to a large scale and also statistics can prove the effects of such application through non supervision trainings and small data algorithm, learning algorithm breakthroughs, we can reduce the application of artificial intelligence cost in many areas. And artificial intelligence has never been as tangible as today, especially in the 14th five-year plan period. It is a very critical window for solving the important social issues through artificial intelligence. The population aging is still undergoing, and we are focusing on that. Actually, in Tianjin, we have developed some usage case. For example, the artificial intelligence can collect the data of using a natural gas, a tap water, etc., to sense the life situation of the elder elder people. And in terms of smart education, we can analyze the learning situation of kids. And also on the uh, on the basis of special features of each kid, we can 
enable targeted guidance and instruction of these children. Every kid may have different exercises. And this system has covered more than 1 million teachers and students in 40,000 schools from 32 provinces. And also in terms of smart medicine, we follow the same logic. This is to, ins this is to help the frontline doctors in villages to have better diagnosis. We have covered more than 200 level three hospitals in 26 provinces and municipalities. And also we have established a automatic warning system for serious diseases and, and infectious diseases. And also the sales of to see products like the translation machine, et cetera, has been skyrocketing in many cities and the provinces. And the language recognition has been expanded to the industrial sound. This can be used in the detection of the faults in machines. In the following five to 10 years, the iFlat tech hoped to build a Babel tower for the human being to cross over the language barriers so that we can better build the community of shared future for mankind. Our idea is to work together with all the developers to achieve the ultimate dream of the artificial intelligence, that is to let everyone stand on the shoulder of the artificial intelligence and to usher in a even greater brand new era. We look forward to taking the platform of IGF to promote the development of, of the community of shared future for mankind. Thank you. I gave the floor to Mr. Ma Yanqun, Senior Director of the Deep Learning Platform of Baidu. Yanqun, please. Distinguished guests, I'm an AI scientist at Baidu. Uh, it's a pleasure to be invited here. Uh, my own background is uh, natural language processing. Uh, actually, I had a PhD at Dublin in Ireland, so uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, well, my topic today, is, I'm going to talk about uh, several trends I observed over the years. Uh, that is uh, the fusion of technology, AI technology, uh, lowering the barrier of AI adoption and also open source. And so in the following, I, I think I'm going to speak in Chinese in the following. Uh, well, I have several slides as well in, in Chinese though. Uh, okay. Uh, Currently, we are in the new round of a scientific and industrial revolution. And the whole society is undergoing a profound changes. From some statistics, we can show that in 2020, the digital economy has reached 39.2 trillion RMB, and it has accounted for 38.6% of the total GDP of China. In the process of the robust development of artificial intelligence, the Digital, the digitalization of industries is actually a new phase of the development of digital economy, and it has been penetrated to the, all the links in the economic activities. And as we can see, the share of the non-internet IT industry has been in, has increased to 53.4% in 2018 to 60.9% in 2020. And also we have seen that the combination of artificial intelligence and industry has witnessed more and more professional cases and scenarios. In Baidu, we have an AICA training program. In this slide, actually, this slide show, shows the trainees selection of their subjects, their research subjects. And as we can see, the selection of our trainees 
research subjects has been more and more combined with their own industries. As I have mentioned, we have three features. The first is technology fusion and innovation. This has been a more and more obvious trend. The knowledge and deep learning is being integrated. As Professor Gong has mentioned, the large scale pre training model represented by GPT-3 has brought through, has brought many breakthroughs for the artificial intelligence. It has very strong generality and ability of movement and transfer. And in Baidu, on, on the basis of, of, a, of a knowledge graph or mapping, we have combined this technology with the with the neural network and we have achieved uh, the best effects in uh, hundreds of models. Actually, this is a very major trend in this process. And also, the deep learning framework has been integrated with smart chips. So as the deep learning technology has been has gone deeper, chips and the framework need to be combined uh, considering the power consumption, latencies, etc. For example, Feijiang, the hyper pedal is our open source platform of deep learning and it has been Com combined with more than 30 chips in the whole world. And this is my first point. My second point is the low is the lowered threshold. Actually, the application of artificial intelligence has been wider and wider. Just now I have mentioned its combination with chips. And as its application has gone wider and wider, we need more low threshold open tools. For example, for those people who actually do not know how to, how to write some code, they can just use a visualized interface without operating code. And for other developers who have the AI technology background, they can have a Auto, they, they can have a self-researching model, which means that the AI platform is needed to output different levels of capacity. And in this process, lowering the threshold has become more and more important. Thirdly, the artificial intelligence development has been developed because of the open source. The open source is, has actually become a very obvious trend. The open source has become an important model and a core engine of technology innovation and industrial development. We have been talking about the open source of the source code, including the data technology platform, all of this can be opened, can be open source. And this can support the high-speed development and industrial application of artificial intelligence. As I have mentioned, the Paddle Paddle, that is the deep learning platform of Baidu, is totally open sourced. It now has gathered more than 3.7 million developers. That is to say, as far as I'm concerned, open source will become a very important engine for promoting the development of artificial intelligence. So just now I've mentioned the technology fusion, lowering threshold, threshold and open source. We hope that we can work together with all other partners and friends to explore the governance of the artificial intelligence. Thank you. <clears throat> the race of the next generation AI is injecting new water, uh, 
vitality to economic and uh, social development across the globe. Smart technology ranged from 5G and big data to smart mobility and smart city, uh, reshaping social development and the people's lives at an unprecedented pace and scale. In the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, AI has played an important role in various detection and uh, diagnose, uh, diagnosis, contact treating, uh, tricking, facing, face recognition, and the daily moderating, and has profound impact on economic development, social governance, and the people's livelihoods across the world. With the extensive application of AI, however, comes the concern about how to strike the balance between its benefit and the potential risks. Therefore, it is urgent to develop, uh, delve into the topic of AI governance and the cooperation on a global scale. Now, let's move on to the second topic, international governance of AI and the international cooperation. Let me give the floor to Professor Xue Lan. He's the Dean of a uh, uh, Southern German College and the Dean of Institute for AI International Governance of Tsinghua University. Professor Xue, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Lee. I think uh, uh, for this opportunity uh, to speak at this, uh, uh, at this forum. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, great. Can you all see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, I think that the, uh, given the limited time and given the, I think my, uh, the former, uh, you know, the, the previous speakers, uh, I would directly zoom on to the, uh, in the global governance of AI. I think um, we know that in the last few years, I say that China has really uh, done a lot of work on the uh, domestic, you know, uh, uh, AI governance issues. I will not belab belabor you on, on those issues. But I was uh, directly focused on the global governance of AI. First of all, it's why. I think there are indeed some people say, you know, I think China has been working hard on the developing the technology and, uh, and, and its application. Uh, so there's not, you know, why don't we care? Uh, indeed, I think we do have to care. Uh, first of all, I think that, uh, you know, I think global governance can facilitate the production for common goods. As we, I think we, we've already, heard that the previous uh, speakers have already talked about how AI actually can produce, promote human well-being. But actually to maximize the benefits, I think the cooperation and the coordination among international uh, community would be uh, really needed. Many AI development involves many cross-sector, you know, cross-sector sort of cross-border issues. For example, I think, uh, you know, our colleagues have talked about open source, about data flow, about the, you know, cybersecurity. And of course, not to, to mention about the scientific collaborations among different countries. So all of those, I think, means that we, uh, in order to maximize the benefits of AI, we do need the uh, international collaboration. And the second thing is common concerns. I think AI could have you know, devastating sort of impact on human society. And so it, you know, for those issues, it's unlikely to be addressed by single country. So I think uh, uh, you know, we need to, to have you know, sort of proper global governance regime in order to avoid a kind of a, a, a you know, risk to the bottom competition that might lead to a new arms race in AI. So I think those, you know, uh, issues need to be addressed at the global level. And the third is that, um, uh, that we need to reconcile differences uh, among different countries. I think we, uh, you know, different countries have very different uh, uh, cultures and uh, different stage of development and, and, and so on. And so they were with many different distinctive institutions and, and, and the strategies. So I, I think we need to work together to build you know, some a global governance system so that we can reach a you know, consensus and, and, uh, you know, and you know, hopefully we can promote collective actions at the global level. So I think that there are just a few simple reasons and the second is, you know, I think uh, in, in terms of China's position on international AI governance, just, you know, a very quick summary of my, you know, a personal review. 
I think China has been trying to work with other countries and the international community to, to really promote AI for good and to also to develop AI plus, the meaning the application of AI in different regions and also to study social impact. And also China has been trying to maintain open development to promote international uh, collaboration and to oppose decoupling. And third is that China, you know, is working hard to support inclusive rulemaking, uh, particularly to support, you know, UN-based discussion and debates on, you know, governance principles and prevent the dominance of a few. And, uh, and also to address the issue of late commerce. And, and also we uh, wanted to respect that different countries have different laws and regulations and also uh, try to leave uh, space for AI's rapid development. And, and in particular, I think that in, in the development of AI governance, uh, we recognize the role a business sector that can play in, in, uh, in, in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the governance of AI. And the third, what, what, what's the next step for international AI governance? I think the first thing that we need to establish, you know, global platforms to coordinate AI governance issues. So I think the recent uh, publication of a, a UNESCO document, AI, uh, you know, principles, I think are, are really an excellent, uh, you know, uh, steps in, in, in achieving that. The second is that we really need, need to learn lessons from other uh, global governance on important issues, for example, in terms of internet governance, on nuclear governance, on space law and climate change. So I think we can learn from all of those, you know, uh, uh, major uh, global governance issues, uh, you know, items that we can actually help, that can, can help us to de develop proper AI governance regime. And the third is to strengthen scientific collaboration in, in AI research which actually is already prospering, I think, you know, in, in many areas. But also we need to work together on issues related to AI governance and also to study the social impact of AI. And the fourth is to seek common values while respect differences, you know, considering the social, economic, and political and cultural differences among different countries. And finally, to develop common principles and norms to guide the, to guide the health development and development of AI. So I think that's sort of the, and what I, I see, you know, from my personal view, the, the ways that we need to move forward to, uh, to help to pr promote international uh, AI governance uh, collaboration. So let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Xue. We know that you have uh, provided great uh, contribution on the AI uh, governance and uh, rules making in China. Thank you for your great speech. Mm -hmm. Now the following is uh, Torsten Yelinik, founder and the managing director, DPG Digital Platform Governance, will share his insight, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. And uh, I can see some friends and are delighted um, to attend uh, this uh, important meeting. So. Uh, let me read this to you, please. So the crisis in multilateralism comes along with the return of sovereignty. The problem is not sovereignty, of course, but the fine, brittle line that separates sovereignty uh, from protectionism, fragmentation and so-called balkanization. The return of today's sovereignty risks undoing the achievements uh, of the internet revolution, including the rise of global innovation and value networks that are so important to tackle today's global issues, and some of them uh, we heard today already. The focus on digital sovereignty is largely a response to the disproportionately negative impact of digitalization on communication, society, economy, government, and even foreign relations. It is supposed to provide an, an environment that safeguards our participation in the digital world, improves its trustworthiness, and increase our confidence in the digital future. Digital sovereignty is also an opportunity not to be trapped in a straight jacket again, this time not of hyper-globalization, but of hyper-connectivity. Not to be trapped in a straight jacket means the ability to regulate national affairs more independently and better cushion the disruptions of digitalization. Here we can see some level of convergence across the major economies in terms of privacy protection, cybersecurity, uh, and fair digital competition, what Professor Xu has also highlighted. 
the security uh, the scrutiny of big tech recently is a clear expression of that turn towards or return towards more digital sovereignty governance is always striking a balance between autonomy and restriction let's take the european commission's ai act proposal as an example industry has raised the concern that this act would stifle innovation and competitiveness for civil society groups it does not go far enough in terms of regulating or prohibiting risky ai applications and such risk-based or ex-ante governance approach has received strong support as we already heard by the new non-binding unesco recommendation on the ethics of ai and yet there is another twist the european union has made digital sovereignty a key pillar of its digital uh, of its political agenda and wants to become the world's safest digital environment and market and a global digital norms builder which is quite laudable however the united states criticizes europe's digital sovereignty strategy as protectionist but to be fair the United States has dominated not only the Internet since its rise, but also before the era of regulated telecommunication monopolies for the most part of the, 21st, of the 20th century. Now, with the rise of China, we have already seen a rebalancing in terms of technology leadership and institutional domination. Those, de those, those developments have also strongly added to the return of territorial and digital sovereignty. Let me now focus on some more similarities and differences between the internet and AI in relations to governance. Firstly, AI, like the internet was before, is a Schumpeterian engine of change, the driving force, obviously, of the 21st century's transformation. The internet was such force of creative destruction, but the internet did not promote or adhere to any specific ideology. Both internet technology and AI do not carry any intrinsic ethics, except that the underlying scientific drive is one of relentless objectification and rationalization. In the past, the rapid global adaptation of the internet technology was largely a result of capitalist expansion and you might call it benevolent hegemony at least initially. With AI, we won't witness such moment of benevolent hegem hegemony, which came from the United States, of course. Its rise or the rise of AI has immediately become a matter of fierce competition, dominance and control. I mean, for that matter, we are discussing it, how to better govern it, obviously. Secondly, why do we fear AI? Or many, not all, certainly. Because objectification, will no longer be the sole faculty of the human brain. Subjectivity provides our sense of autonomy and freedom. The question is how much of it will remain in the age of ubiquitous automated objectification. Furthermore, intelligent automation will not only disrupt domestic labor markets, but also entire development models which have relied on the absorption of rural labor. Many workers might not be able to reskill from jobs of execution to exploration, from repetition to dexterity and creativity, from non-social to social interaction and empathy. Those risks don't just pose another technology trap, because as our modern world relies on technology and markets elevating the forcefulness of technology, AI will continue facing an insurmountable governance gap. It is this void that makes the disruptive character of AI not a simple choice between doing good or doing harm. Thus, without intervention, the current trajectory of history will mainly determine the way we use AI. In other words, an overarching principle of governance and cooperation, we do need human-centric AI. We do need AI for sustainability or sustainable AI but we also need responsible global competition and a mechanism for avoiding or reducing conflict and rivalry. However, given, to conclude, however, given that different cultural values and political systems, different histories and stages of development will continue causing divergent views, 
a more flexible and nuanced approach is needed. The reform of the global political system must be open to ambiguity, must embrace special and differential treatment of countries and attempt to solve problems with a more flexible and case-by-case -case approach. We need, an international governance and we need international governance and cooperation and involve all major and rising powers to counterbalance that strong demand for territorial and digital sovereignty. I believe that only then our efforts will have a chance no longer to be at risk of being primarily a conduit of fierce competition, technocratism and national security. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yelnik. And uh, up next is Professor Ayad Arani, Associated Member at Einstein Center Digital Future. So, Ayad, are you here? It's you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning from my side. Um, I would like to talk to you in the next couple of minutes about how to achieve global ethical standards and the development of automation. Uh, well, it's after listening to, to all of you, it's really not difficult to assume that in the future, much of our economic activities will be guided by some kind of artificial intelligence that will in the end be responsible for decisions that, that shape our lives. The, the Austrian American robot scientist Hans Moravec assumed that by the year 2050, fully automated factories will be managed by some sort of robotic authority. This robo boss, according to Moravec, will not be guided by personal gain. And that's interesting, income or profit but its main motivation will be the survival and well-being of the factory and the community that is housing the factory and that is extracting taxes from it. The dynamics of capitalism will be therefore replaced by the dynamics of reproduction. Companies that squander resources by paying its owners will be pushed out of the market. So, so goes the scenario. The interaction between those fully automated entities will also we need to be guided by some sort of ethical standards reflecting uh, societal paradigms, legal and economic rules and assumptions, for instance, anti-monopolistic behavior, etc. In a nutshell, this leading intelligence would be designed in such a way as to enjoy servicing humans. Now, as we are heading towards a multi-civilizational world, meaning that there will be some kind of uh, alliance of uh, self-labeled democratic countries in the West, and technocratic civilizations uh, of the global south dominated by China, we need to be concerned with the questions whether the machines and artificial intelligence will also be part of these respective hegemonies, if they will be just as antagonistic. This, of course, would be a problem when machines and artificial intelligence will be recruited in a possible subtle or not so subtle struggle between those hegemonies, the conflict will become dangerously multiplied and automated. Or is there, is there another way? Thinkers of the future have sometimes assumed that there will be one rule that is guiding machines. Of course, I'm thinking here of Isaac Asimov's famous three laws of robotics. The problem is that Asimov never described how those laws became enshrined in the production of machines. The only Albert Waring hint we get is that Asimov's stories also describe a past conflict between machines and humans, and thereafter machines are forbidden on earth. A scenario where humanity finally unites to struggle against machines it can't control any longer. Translated into our situation, with all difficulties, this would mean that we already would have one global civilization that is trying to regulate and develop the machines in a certain way and ensures that future editions of human laws are translated into design guidelines. For instance, robots must obey humans, uh, robots should never harm humans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The question then is if the current international organizations are in the position to impose such design guidelines or ethical standards. And more so if societies are in control of the private companies that are designing this intelligence. And I think the answer is unfortunately no. Uh, it's not only the case that there is no global institution in charge and powerful enough to enforce such ruling, Worse, even in the respective hegemonies, there is the question of whether the political forces are still in full control 
of its intelligence production entities. At this point, maybe a global virtual room, a global platform like the anticipated metaverse project or other uh, IoT platforms could be an option. Although the metaverse project, for instance, contains lots of issues and difficulties for humanities. For instance, it's the difficulty to differentiate between the reality and the imaginative. Creating a single civilizational room, although this being a virtual copy, might be a solution if all hegemonies could be could participate in the decentralized development of such a platform. In the metaverse, algorithms and machines must adhere to some kind of global governance and rules. And if conflicts arise, they are still in the virtual copy and could could be contained and fixed before spilling over to the real world. There would then be enough time or would be enough room for discussion and solution finding. This must not happen, but there is a chance that this could happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ayad Arani. Uh, up next is uh, Professor Luca Bailey, Professor of Internet Governance and Regulations. Foundation Catoleo Vagas. Luca, please. Good morning to everyone, and thank you very much for having invited me to be part of this IGF Open Forum on the developments and rulemaking on artificial intelligence. Uh, and I would like to salute also the uh, Chinese Academy of Cyberspace Studies for having organized this very timely conversation. My name is Luca Belli. I am professor at FGV Law School, where I am, I'm also the head of the Center for Technology and Society here at Rio de Janeiro. And uh, I would like to uh, briefly present a little bit of the regulatory initiatives that are happening in, in Brazil in this very moment. Uh, as you all know, and I'm sure you have been discussing over the past uh, minutes, the, the states uh, at various regional level and also inter intergovernmental organizations are studying and uh, are discussing quite intensely, I would say, uh, some AI regulatory frameworks to regulate AI systems. They are both utilized in the public and private sector. Uh, there are a lot of questions that are still unanswered. For instance, whether a self-regulatory approach, a co-regulatory approach, or uh, a legal approach uh, are the best suited to regulate AI, or what kind of governance uh, framework should be uh, utilized, which kind of uh, regulatory authority should have a, a competence, a remit to uh, oversee the implementation of AI regulation, a specific dedicated AI regulator, existing sectoral regulators. There are a lot of questions that are yet not answered. There are already some uh, global uh, initiatives uh, to try to frame AI, for instance, the very recent UNESCO guidelines on AI ethics or the uh, the OECD recommendation on AI that was elaborated in 2019, and the Brazilian current Brazilian Bill 21 2020 uh, is largely inspired from the uh, from the uh, OECD recommendation. Although Brazil is not part of the OECD, uh, Brazil has signed into this uh, recommendation, and the uh, very uh, rapporteur of the bill, the bill, the AI bill, has referred to the AI uh, recommendation of the OECD. The aim of this recommendation is to bring a safe environment for uh, the use of AI in the country with transparency, ethics, respect of fundamental rights. It, the bill itself stresses the need to also apply uh, regulation in synergy with existing regulation, uh, chiefly the recently approved uh, Brazilian data protection uh, law, the LGPD, our uh, GDPR with Brazilian characteristics. And the, uh, the uh, bill, the AI bill consists of 16 articles. So it's a very concise bill. Uh, it is largely inspired uh, by the, the, uh, the OECD recommendations. And uh, there is no specific limitation on types of AI that should not be 
uh, uh, implemented that should not that should be prohibited there is no such uh, prohibition as we may see for instance in the proposals that uh, are emerging at the european level the uh, uh, text highlights that uh, the, the the measures will be implemented according to the maturation and evolution of technology uh, by uh, with a more risk-based ap approach but implemented on a sectorial basis and it is quite clear why there is such a light touch uh, in the in that is proposed by the the bill because it facilitates enormously its approval in the in the cons in the congress which is a noble intention to try to facilitate the approval of the law but uh, it also creates some some problems uh, the the main problem in this very light approach is that uh, it lacks uh, specific norms, specific guidance, and leaves the door open. Uh, because the time limits, we will move on to the concluding remarks session. Okay, so uh, now let's welcome uh, Xuan Xingzhang, Vice President uh, of the Chinese Academy of Cyberspace Studies to give closing remarks. Xingzhang, please. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, today we used about one hour to talk about the artificial intelligence, the development of rulemaking on artificial intelligence. Today, this year is the sixth consecutive year for the type for the Cybersecurity Association of China to hold this forum. We have seen representatives from different institutions and from the academia to gather together to share our opinions and ideas. They have, the artificial intelligence is influencing people's lifestyle and the way of production, and it has also uh, proposed the new tasks to the government uh, in terms of legislation, governance, etc. I would like to propose the uh, my some of my points. First, we need to shoulder the responsibility of the era together. Artificial intelligence means new opportunity. However, the uncertainty of the artificial intelligence have brought some challenges to the governance. The think tanks need to pursue people's well-being, enhance the judgment of the risks so that so as to enable the AI to better serve people's life. And second, we need to be a good bridge between different parties. Promoting a good governance of AI is the common task of the international community. We need to make innovations in methods of governance, uh, in terms of ethics, etc. And we need to contribute our wisdom to the governance system. And third, we need to abandon the prejudice. Some people regard the AI as some uh, evil technology. The, we need to shoulder our responsibilities to converge uh, consensus from different parties and solve some misunderstandings. And fourth, AI is an open technology. Its development needs the cooperation of different participants and different parties. The, the Chinese Academy of Cyberspace Studies has launched the reports, annual reports for five consecutive years. We work together with other partners to contribute our wisdom to the development of AI. We hope to enable the AI to serve the human being. This is the tasks of the think tank. We need to work better to improve people's well-being and to promote social progress through artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Jim, thank you all again for your insights and the contributions to this forum. I think Certainly, uh, thank you and hope that all parties will continue in deep exchanges, enhance trust, and making unremitting efforts for the development of cyberspace and a bright future for all. Thank you again for your participation. Let's end for this forum. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.